Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast, and it's time to begin the Takashi Miike filmography review. If you haven't already, definitely check out my introduction video on this playlist for some of my thoughts on Miike's filmography overall. I'll leave a link in the description box below. Again, this is going to be very similar to my Asian horror year in review playlist, where I briefly cover the films in chronological order. In theory, you should gain a greater knowledge of Miike's filmography while at the same time receiving just enough information on each individual film so that you can decide on which films you may want to check out yourself. So I will be reviewing 10 films tonight, all of which I believe were either released uh, direct-to-video or made for television. They all had very low budgets and basically represent the earliest phase of this director's career. A phase that mostly ended probably in 1995 when Shinjuku Triad Society was released. And that will be the first film I review in part 2 of this playlist. Now, gotta be honest with you, if you have not seen any of the Miike films that predate Shinjuku Triad Society, you're not really missing very much. There are a few watchable ones that are mixed in with a lot of forgettable fluff. Nevertheless, you may be interested in simply knowing what this director was making in his early years, so hopefully this video will be useful for that reason alone. And if you're really itching to watch one or two of these super early Miike films because you're a fan, maybe I'll direct you, you know, put you in the right direction to pick a one or two you might want to check out. So we begin way back in 1991 with the first feature-length movie that Miike released, and that is... I Catch Junction from 1991. This is a crime comedy. So the plot involves a few bungling lady cops who attempt to show up their male colleagues by tossing them around in judo practice and drinking them under the table. They have decent fighting skills, but have a history of poor decision making that allows criminals to escape their arrest. So these girls join forces and call themselves I Catch Junction, mostly because they like to wear skimpy outfits and watch men gawk at them. But can they catch a disturbed Yakuza who wears a rubber suit and murders young women? Well, this movie was never officially released with English subtitles, to my knowledge. And it's a bit difficult to assess this one without subs because it's primarily a comedy. But even so, a lot of the humor was in the form of visual gags. And I was on board with this one for like the opening half hour. The actresses were generally likable. Uh, so that helped. I, I found it rather amusing early on. But then it started to lose me a bit when it introduced the villain and infused some nudity and sleaziness, which created an awkward tonal shift that really conflicted with the uh, Police Academy-style shenanigans uh, that preceded it. And this criticism is coming from a guy who enjoyed the Korean films Confessions of Murder and Fabricated City, both of which had huge tonal shifts. I usually welcome this kind of thing, but I Catch Junction was too clumsy in its execution. Uh, for example, the villain is first portrayed as a perverted, a perverted sleazeball, and then later a harmless goofball. It just, I don't know, it just didn't work for me, it didn't mesh well. And there are a few other Miike films where I think tonal shifts really hurt uh, the overall, overall enjoyment. So we'll get to those later. But, uh, you know, this film never really did anything well enough to make up for its clumsy handling of tones. There's really no good action or fights to get out of this. Uh, that doesn't help. The ending's pretty lame, too, I thought. I think the negatives outweigh the positives here, so I do not recommend Eye Catch Junction. In terms of availability, I previously mentioned that it was not officially released with English subtitles, but it is available on YouTube with a fan-subbed translation, so... It's, uh, it's out there for you if you want to check out Miike's first film that he released. Now, our next film was actually the first feature-length film that Miike completed. But for some reason, I Catch Junction was released on video a few months before this one. So I'm sure that happened, you know, back in the day a little bit where, you know, when you're doing these direct-to-video films, you make a few of them, at a, you know, in a short period of time, and just one of them gets released before the other. You know what I'm saying? But this one is called Red Hunter, Prelude to a Kill. And again, 1991 release, uh, and it's an action film. 
So the plot of this direct video effort concerns a female commando who fights bad guys after a little boy is targeted for kidnapping. That's actually, uh, or I should say, there's actually a computer scene later in the film in English that gives her a complete resume, which is quite convenient for viewers such as myself. So our lady protagonist, as the computer mentions, had extensive military experience with both Japanese and American forces serving in various war-torn areas. Now, she actually has nightmares of these experiences when she sleeps. And it turns out that this little kid isn't just a normal little kid. You know, the bad guys are attempting to kidnap him because he's the lost prince of a country that does not exist in the real world. So that's why they want to kidnap him, I guess. So they can use him as leverage to overthrow the current king or something to that effect. So despite the oddball plot element involving the Lost Prince, this is a by-the-numbers B-grade actioner with a very limited budget, of course. Even when compared to Mike's more popular lower-budget works, this is about as low of a budget, budget as you're going to get in his filmography, which you know is kind of like all the films we're discussing tonight. So for example, you know the nightmare scenes in this movie felt like stock footage. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Uh, but there are only a few of them, and they're very short, so not a big deal. Fortunately, this does have a number of entertaining elements. There's a decent amount of action, with a lengthy home invasion sequence that uh, I thought was a highlight. There are also a few MacGyver-esque moments that uh, were, were rather amusing. The finale isn't as good as the earlier action scene in the house, but it's moderately satisfying. So there is some charming B-movie cheesiness in this in spots as well. Uh, even one or two genuine surprises. On a side note, there's an American character who shows up for about five minutes, which usually spells disaster. If you're familiar uh, with Asian movies and have seen your fair share of Asian movies, usually in an Asian movie, especially a Japanese movie, when an American actor shows up, it's quite embarrassing. But the guy in this movie actually worked, I thought. I almost couldn't believe it. He's not in the film long, but I actually kind of like the actor and his character. So the total runtime of this one is 80 minutes. Flies by fairly quickly because of that. There's one scene of nudity, but it's kind of played for laughs. So if you're really, if you're really itching to watch like one of these, uh, you know, one of Miki's very first films, Red Hunter Prelude to a Kill is a decent one to seek out. I would moderately recommend this one. So, you know, if you can find it, check it out. Unfortunately, it's difficult to find. I'm sure I saw it on either YouTube or Daily Motion at one point, but it's, uh, I guess, it's been taken down since then. So, you know, keep perusing around. You might be able to find it. All right, our next film tonight, not quite, not quite as memorable, unfortunately. And this one is called Last Run from 1992. This is a drama, I would say. So Mike directs this one about a former racing champion uh, who is asked to assist in an auction of vintage cars that are currently owned by his longtime rival. But it's soon discovered that some people are attempting to like rig the auction in an attempt to purchase these sweet rides for dirt cheap, I guess. So a former lover enters the mix, of course, which complicates matters. So will these rivals unite to take down the schemer, or will their past rivalries return with a vengeance? So when I was reading the, uh, you know, the Tom Mess book, Agitator, the Cinema of Takashi Miike, he mentioned that the screenplay for this film was actually the winner of a contest in real life that was proposed by like a newspaper, like a financial newspaper which asked its readers to pen a screenplay that implemented the theme of business in it. So in this film, you have a business of, like, auctioning, and, you know, you basically have a slimy businessman as a villain. So from a viewer's perspective, it, it is kind of difficult to assess this film uh, without subtitles, especially because there's... Much of the film does consist of dialogue. But fortunately... The Tom Mess book I just referenced has an extremely detailed synopsis that discusses all of the character motivations, plot threads, and the big finale, so that, that definitely helped. Uh, there's really no action in this, or horror, or thriller elements, no genre elements that'll, that'll really keep you, keep you going visually. It's a basic drama, 
involving a shady businessman. But with that said, it, I did notice that the acting was pretty good. Uh, the plot is slow moving, but there is some cool twists to enjoy. Uh, most everything else is kind of simplistic and ho-hum, though. Even Mickey's direction is just kind of run-of-the-mill. You know, uh, we've not really reached that point where his distinctive directing style would be evident. Uh, so if you were ever to, to watch the last run, it feels like anyone really could have been behind the camera in this. So I don't, I do not recommend this movie. It's not bad or anything, but uh, it's just kind of forgettable. But you may not have a choice, because just like Red Hunter Prelude to a Kill, it's tough to find. Alright, our next one here. <coughs> Man, these films are really low-grade stuff, people. You, I hope I'm giving you the right feel. These are like real low-grade, you know, low-budget stuff that we're talking about tonight. This one's called, get this title, Human Murder Weapon. Also known as... Ningen uh, Kiyoki Ai To Ikari no uh, from 1992. This is kind of crime action, I guess you could call it. So this one's about a young fighter who dreams of being a professional wrestler, but is forced at gunpoint by a seedy Scarface promoter and his two henchmen to compete in bloody underground fights instead. Even worse, our protagonist's nightclub girlfriend is forced to participate in these bloody matches as well, but her female opponents are far more athletic than she is. Can our man find a way to escape this slave-like existence? So as you might expect from the brief synopsis I gave, Human Murder Weapon is likely the flimsiest film we've covered so far tonight, at least in terms of plot and character development. This is just simple, trashy stuff for undemanding viewers. But that does not mean that it's uh, completely worthless. Sure, there's some nudity, and the female lead is persistently exploited in the ring by getting pummeled and stripped bare for the crowd's enjoyment, but this also has some cheesy B-movie fights that look, uh, you know, fake most of the time and can provoke some unintentional laughter. There's a lot of fights in the ring in this, uh, and that does help a little bit in terms of entertainment value and pacing. The environments are very limited here, with extensive use of the arena set, which is basically a really cheap, small boxing gym. <laughs> it creates a cramped and monotonous visual style that will likely get on the viewer's nerves. Acting is uh, subpar, and even the direction by Mike, again, lacking in any style or interesting techniques, seems to be kind of a theme for this evening. So Human Murder Weapon is only about 70 minutes long, but it's so low-grade that most people won't want to sit through this. I found it to be like barely watchable if I'm in the mood, mostly due to these cheesy fight matches, but uh, I cannot recommend this. Now, Human Murder Weapon, unbelievably, is available on YouTube, but it's without subtitles. So, if you have to choose between uh, Eye Catch Junction or Human Murder Weapon, ay ay ay. I don't know, flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> for the two the two that are available on YouTube. All right, our next one here. It's actually a two-part movie. It's called Word No Angels 1 and 2, also known as Oritachi wa Tenshi Janai 1 and 2 or uh Ichi ni, I guess it might be. These are crime drama comedy action hybrids. So a former Yakuza, just released from prison and attempting to live a normal life, finds himself butting heads with a group of gangsters. Immediately after being released, though, from prison, he reunites with a former criminal colleague who's now a transgender and gets a job at a gift delivery service. But soon after, conflict arises when one of the employees is conned by a Yakuza-backed cult. Uh, so the second movie seems to toss in some other plot lines and conflicts in rather messy ways. So it starts off with that, uh, that premise, and it uh, you know flows into some other stuff. Now, these two films by Miki have uh, simplistic, lowbrow humor that is readily apparent even without subtitles. It's the kind of humor that I'm not a fan of, and this kind of stuff usually gets on my nerves. You know, you got a character who uh, sees a hot girl in the street, so he immediately grabs his nuts, you know, and you're supposed to laugh because of that. There's in another scene very early on, it involves semen. I did not like the humor in this movie. 
There is some nudity and sex, of course, and in this film it always feels gratuitous and obnoxious. I did, you know, even that part I didn't even enjoy. Similar to I Catch Junction, the, the shifts in tone really screw this film up. And again, that's a criticism coming from someone who loves tonal shifts, but, you know, Mike, especially early, earlier in his career, just did not f yet find that craftsmanship to make it work and portray it in interesting ways or at least to serve the, so the story and characters. But to be fair, you know, these films are amusing in spots, but that's mostly when our protagonist continually punches people in the face. You know, for some reason, that kind of thing does amuse me. Now, the second film out of the two, you know, it acts obviously as a part two that continues the story of part one. It's a bit more serious and does a better job of avoiding some of those low-grade jokes but it still suffers from many of the same non-comedic flaws. The runtime of each of these installments is only about 70 minutes, but they still feel a bit on the long side. Certainly, if you're watching both films back to back, it's a long sit at 140 minutes. So I do not recommend We're No Angels 1 and 2. But it may not matter because it's difficult to find. You're not used to me uh, criticizing so many movies, right? A lot of my single movie reviews on my YouTube channel, I'm, I'm always recommending them. I get kind of worried that people think I'm just a shill who likes every Asian movie out there, but really my Asian horror playlist and this playlist should put that concern to bed because there's a lot of movies I do not like. Our next one here, though, our next one here is, is pretty good, I think. We're not doing too well tonight. We've looked at five movies, only really one of which I would kind of recommend, and that was a cautious recommendation. But fortunately, our next film is probably the most entertaining title of the evening. Not saying much, but it is what it is, and that is Bodyguard Kiba from 1993. So in this one, an ex-prisoner hires a, uh, the invincible bodyguard Kiba to protect him from vengeful Yakuza. Uh, the leader of which is played by Ren Osuji, of course, while he retrieves a stash of cash in Okinawa. So five years ago, Kiba's client stole a bunch of money from the Yakuza and got caught, but he lucked out when a police raid saved him from getting murdered out of retaliation. So without weapons, Kiba conquers the enemy uh, that's, that's targeting this guy with his huge deadly fists. The fight scene, uh, you know, there's like fight scene upon fight scene, kind of packs it in. There's pinky slicing, torture, drugs, sex, and violent exchanges. So Mike brings some welcome energy into this uh, particular title. Uh, there's plenty of fist fights and exaggerated sound effects, which I liked. The opening scene actually feels like an immediate upgrade from most of the films that we've already covered tonight, because it has some moody lighting to it and gets right to the action. And I gotta tell you, Watching this big dude punch and kick people in the face is kind of entertaining. You know, fight choreography is basic, it's lim it's, it's, but it's filmed well, and you can clearly see everything that's happening. As an added bonus, we're actually treated to a brief martial arts challenge on a seaside cliff, which I kind of liked. Now, the lead actor here is he's mediocre in terms of, uh, you know, uh, acting ability. But the supporting players help to make up for it. You know, including Reno Suji, of course, who plays a real slime ball again. Character and story development is decent. It's not terrible. It's not good. Decent. At one point in the film, Kiba scolds his client for pulling a gun on the bad guys who are trying to kill him. And uh, I was like, why did he tell him to do that? To shoot the guy. But eventually he provides an explanation that actually does make sense. There, there are a few good scenes outside of the action in this one. Uh... This B-movie is more engaging than it probably should have been, but it's helpful to go in understanding that it's a very low-budget flick. Another thing to understand is that it does get a bit dark at times, too, and that includes a few rape scenes, so just be prepared for that. But Body Card Kiba, it's a pretty good flick. And most fortunately, it's widely available on DVD in the United States. So I think uh, the distributors chose the right one, from the first few years of Mike's career to have widely available. So, uh, you know, it's a good one. I think it's pretty good. We're going to cover the sequels. That'll be interesting. <laughs> the next one. Next one, 
Well, not as good as Bodyguard Kiba, but it's not that bad. And that is Shinjuku Outlaw from 1994. This is a crime action drama. So not surprisingly, this film concerns Yakuza conflict, as the title suggests. It opens with a Yakuza henchman who successfully assassinates a rival crime boss. But in the process of doing so, he gets blasted full of bullets and falls into a coma. A decade later, he wakes up and gets a cold welcome from his old syndicate. So he flees to Tokyo and befriends one of their enemies. Meanwhile, a gang from Taiwan is attempting to muscle into the Yakuza's territory. So the conflict is established fairly early on, when our protagonist gets muscled into doing some things against his will. You know, this our protagonist here is not a particularly likable character, but he's got guts and he attempts to maneuver his way through all of these gangster conflicts, and that does create a fairly interesting situation to revolve around. Shinjuku Outlaw is slowly paced. It's definitely slower than Bodyguard Kiba, uh, and it only contributes a small handful of action scenes, but it's gritty, you know, it's hard-edged, and it's pretty violent at times. When the shootouts show up, they're pretty good, albeit unexceptional. One woman in particular gets a real nasty beating that's hard to watch. Uh, Carnage ramps up more during the final half hour, which I think should please fans of this director. So it's a pretty good outing for Mike. You know, not amongst his best Yakuza flicks, obviously. You know, for fans of this director, I would moderately recommend this, but if you're just getting into Mike, I would recommend some of his subsequent crime flicks, which we will cover later. Now, Shinjuku Outlaw. Difficult to find. All right, time moves fast. We're already at the Bodyguard Kiva sequels, and there's two of them. Yes, you may not know that, and I'll cover that in a minute. But our next film here is called Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse from 1994, and it's an action movie. So Kiba returns to protect a woman from bad guys in Taiwan. Plot here is even looser than the original film, mostly because the conflicts don't really seem to be connected to this woman very much. It's actually hard to describe what this film is about. Kiba tangles with like a karate master, who promptly sends his men out to get rid of Kiba for good. The film's predecessor at least had some reasonably understandable motivations for the characters, but this one, you know, it's definitely more flimsy in that regard. And it's not like the first film was a masterpiece. Now a lot of people, fun fact, <clears throat> do not know this. But there are actually three Bodyguard Kiba films. Bodyguard Kiba from 1993, Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse from 1994, and Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse 2 from 1995. I think only two of these films were released in the United States. From what I gathered, the first and the third films were made available on DVD, with the second film being skipped for some unknown reason. So yes, you may think there were only two of them, but there are actually three. So what about this lost one? Is it any good? Mm, it's alright. Uh, oh, another fun fact first is that the second and third films here were shot back to back, but were released in separate years. Now, this second installment is actually only 65 minutes long, but there's actually barely enough to fill that much runtime. As I mentioned previously, whatever dramatic impact was achieved by, by its predecessor is basically lost in this one, uh, which has the plot of a cheap martial arts flick. So the big question is this, okay? Is there enough low-grade, cheesy, B-movie fighting to make this watchable for less demanding viewers? Maybe. Uh, but only if you're accustomed to zero-budget fighting flicks. There's also a bit of variety in the assassins that come after our protagonists. I mean, heck, there, there are even a few ninja that show up in this, but only for a few minutes. There's also a very awkward dance sequence. It's like a dance club sequence involving a really old dude with a long beard who dances. And uh, you could consider that a positive, depending on your sense of humor. As well as, there's also a few nice shots of Taipei. So, but uh, in summary, Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse is a low-grade movie that most people will not like. Uh, it may be watchable for a select few, so take that as you will. Now, the availability with this, as I mentioned, is difficult to find. All right, that leads us directly to Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse 2 from 1995, again an action movie. 
It's Bodyguard Kiba Fest tonight on this channel. So Kiba returns yet again in the third film of this franchise to protect a girl from bad guys in Hong Kong. Well, at least that's what the plot synopsis says. From what I remember, our boy Kiba was like barely in the film at all. He shows up for a few scenes, I think. The main character in this one is some other bodyguard dude who I think showed up in the second film. Also, the main bad guy is some kind of manager in the entertainment industry. It does it really matter at this point? No. No, it doesn't. Because this movie sucks. Man. Here we go. All right. Regardless of the plot, this is such a poor effort that it could be Mike's adapt adaptation of American Ninja 5. Like, I kid you not. Now, it's not like a lot of the movies we've been covering tonight have been masterpieces. You know, a lot of these films are pretty shoddy, low-grade stuff, but Combat Apocalypse 2 makes them all look so much better. There's poor dialogue in this. Very lame fight scenes with unathletic participants. Sporadic and unfocused narrative. Bad English pronunciation from Japanese actors. Unintentional humor, etc. The overall quality in general is just abysmal in this movie. The production values are amongst the absolute worst of his entire filmography. It's even worse than most of the films that we previously covered this evening. Uh, the cinematography is ugly and the direction lacks any kind of dynamic qualities or energy. Uh, I really need to stress that this is really difficult to sit through, despite the fact that it's only about 72 minutes long. It's so bad that it makes Human Murder Weapon look like Bloodsport. Yeah, it's that bad. Uh, it really does lack the classic Mike feel that most fans are familiar with, which a lot of the films tonight lack that. But I really need to stress that uh, you need to skip this at all costs. And it's widely available on DVD in the United States. <laughs> Don't do it. I'm telling you, if you're a Mike fan and you're going through Amazon.com, you're like, ooh, ooh my, what's this Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse 2 film? Ooh, I haven't seen that one. It sounds great. You know, I saw the first Bodyguard Keep. It was pretty good. Maybe the sequel will be uh, an improvement. Don't do it. Don't do it. I warned you. All right. So we go to our final film tonight, which must be an improvement. It must be an improvement on Bodyguard Kiba Combat Apocalypse 2. Barely. It's barely an improvement. And I'm talking about... Osaka Tough Guys from 1995. <sighs> All right, so in this humorous crime flick, and that's being generous, two losers run out of drinking money and have to look for work. When they luck into high-paying jobs that don't require any experience, they take them immediately, not realizing that they've signed up for the Yakuza. So soon after, they're involved in all kinds of rowdy antics and minor crime, but when their friend is conned into making a hardcore S&M video, they must get serious to help her. So right from the start of this film, our protagonists really don't care about school at all. When they do attend classes, they extort money from the staff for their bar hopping adventures at night. So that's, you know, it's, it actually sets the basis for a possible fun movie. But you have an idea of what this movie is going to be like by around the five minute mark. When a dude dressed like a girl with a thick coat of red lipstick, but acting also kind of like a robot, runs after a Yakuza and tries to kiss him while strutting to a Terminator-inspired tune. It sounds fun, but I thought it was really stupid. So this film was behind the eight ball within the first 10 minutes, and it doesn't get, get from behind that eight ball. Story and characters, wafer thin, but this is a comedy, first and foremost, right? It's a comedy. So does the humor get any better? Nope. It actually gets worse with multiple puke jokes, masturbation jokes, underwear jokes, sex jokes, all low-grade garbage that is thoughtless, repetitive, and rather pathetic. It's some of the worst comedy you will see in this director's filmography. It is just worthless. Very little about this movie that could be deemed good in any way, in my opinion. Unquestionably one of Mike's worst films, but it's still a tad better than Combat Apocalypse 2, probably because the production values are a little bit better. Uh, the less time spent on these two disasters, the better, but I will make this point. Those of you who think that Mike has been in the worst phase of his career during the 2010s should check some of these early films out, these films from the early 90s, 
you're going to change your mind. <laughs> you're going to change your mind. Now, the availability of Osaka Tough Guys, it's actually moderately available on DVD in the United States. All right. But not all is lost here, of course, right? Because Miki will begin to improve the quality of his output very soon, I promise. And I'm confident that the next part of this video series will be far less painful and far more interesting. So be sure to join me for part two of my Takashi Miki filmography review. At least two films of which in that video are must-sees. I'm covering two films in the next video that I think are must-sees, at least two. And uh, one of those ranks among my personal favorites from this director's career. So check it out. And as always, I will see you next time.